Oh, no, I don't remember, absolutely. I was very upset. Not because we had to move. They told us how we were helping out on the war effort and all that sort of baloney. <clears throat> but uh, it was the way they got, uh, got at putting us out. They wanted a, a list made of every blessed thing we possessed, even down to the teaspoons. And I think that is utterly ridiculous. What difference does it make? After all, they were taking it away. One thing, no one's supposed to ask questions, but it was a government project, and uh, told we had to go uh, for that reason to benefit the country, and certainly it was a war. So I don't think anybody specifically asked a lot of questions what they was going to build. Uh, you know, most of the people here are patriotic. You see, they're a close-knit group anyhow, uh, real neighborly, and uh, I don't think they like a lot of things, but that's, I'm sure they, a lot of it was done in the spirit of patriotism. Anyhow, you live someplace there, and you thought that was your home, and then suddenly you find out it isn't, and that you have to go whether you want to or not, you're not very happy, especially if you think you're not being paid very good. It hit me hard when I could see the fruit on the trees, and we couldn't touch it. Can't go home again, but you can try. You remember the good times and the fun you had, and the the freedom, the most of it was freedom. I was angry, and yet, you know, we got caught up in the excitement, too. It was a ex very, very exciting time in my life, despite losing our home and everything. Because that project was something like I've never seen before, and I doubt if there's ever been a project like that. Still got pushed around, you know, where are we at now? But place to live, nothing but rocks. One thousand years before Lewis and Clark came to the Northwest and saw the great bluffs above the bend in the Columbia River, 15 Indian camps stretched along the edge of what is now the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. The Solcucks, or Wanapong, were the first inhabitants of this area. They were a peaceful tribe and established the bend in the river as a crossroads and mecca for tribal celebrations and gatherings. The influx of white settlers in the mid-1800s, forced the Wanapons to an area upriver from the bluffs called Priest Rapids. The sagebrush was cleared, fields of alfalfa were planted, and orchards were developed. A trading post became the town of White Bluffs. In the early 1900s, a large irrigation and electric power project was built eight miles downriver from White Bluffs. And in 1909, the town of Hanford sprang up. The ferry at White Bluffs and the railroad at Hanford connected the two communities and the outlying farms with surrounding markets. The area grew and farms and ranches multiplied in numbers. The climate was ideal for growing soft fruit and the harvests in the region were earlier than anywhere in the Northwest. The depression hit the area in the early 30s and it was a difficult existence for many. Some left, but those who stayed hung together as a community and helped each other through the rough times. The late 30s were productive years, and the towns of Hanford and White Bluffs prospered once again. The beginning of World War II had a great deal to do with this, but the war would soon have a devastating effect on the two communities.
there was a magic about that country up there. We were so isolated that it was special because we didn't have some main highway just running through where you had cars uh, going from one big city to another. And we felt like we owned the land. We rode horseback, we swam, we climbed mountains, and it was all free. We didn't have money, so we had to make our own fun. And I think anybody during the Depression years, of course, that was, those are the years that we remember most. But I think anybody during that time um, had to be creative. And we remember those good times. It was just one big family. Everybody knew what everybody else was doing. It was, it was really a lot of, of community things. Every once in a while we get together, sometimes in the summer, just a few of us. And that's our first conversation is about Hanford, Hanford and White Bluffs. So I don't know how you describe it. It's something intangible, something very, very special that none of us will ever forget. Some people can describe it better, but to me it was the freedom, the freedom that I owned that land. And there were no limitations as to this was my place and that was your place. It was. I felt like it all belonged to me. It was so hot and your feet would burn up and you'd run until you got into the shade of a little bush, you know, and stop and cool them off, run to the next little weed. Not everybody likes swimming, but I'll bet in that town, I don't know of a youngster that didn't learn to swim at some time or another, or learn to dance because we had, <laughs> that was a, one of our main recreations too, was when we got older. But it used to be when we'd be up on the top of Gable, we'd, especially if it was in the winter when the trees were bare, you could look out over the orchards toward White Bluffs, and you could tell what kind of fruit, you know, because each of the apples has a different color bark, and you could see well, those wine saps, they're delicious. That's another thing, there's really nothing that holds anybody in the valley after they graduate from high school. There's no industry and no jobs, so most everyone after they graduated from high school either went on to higher learning in the colleges and the throughout the state, or went off to the big cities to get a job. I left in 38, went down to Portland, went to school for a while down there, and then went to work. And then, of course, when the war came on, we went, went off, volunteered, and we got drafted, as the case may be, in either event, went off to war. And I would say, percentage-wise, the members of the White Bluffs Hanford community that was the youth of the area, I would say almost to an individual. They all signed up and paid their dues to the war effort. Why we were there, we had to live. So we, <laughs> instead of uh, raising uh, old strawberries we were supposed to be, but Get, get enough money off that first crop to pay for your place. And you didn't. So we did, did the next best thing. We ran into chickens and, and turkeys. And we, we raised those. And we got more. And everything was done the hard way with a number two shovel. You didn't have a, I'd say in the whole valley, there wasn't over three tractors. It, it was all done with teams of horses and brawn and hard work. If you had 10, 20 acres, that's all you could take care of. You worked all summer raising hay to feed the horses all winter. <laughs> Exercise and futility. And it was gradually going downhill because, uh, as I mentioned, people were, the youth of the community who had to leave. There was nothing there to hold them. And the old timers were getting older and dying off. So something had to be done. And in one respect, uh, even though it was quite a transition, many of the people are better off, became better off as a result of the government coming in than they probably would have been if they'd stayed. We're a very, very patriotic uh, group of people. <clears throat> and it was during the war, and it was a war effort. And it's, it's a shame that it had to happen that way. I'm sorry that it was our town that was taken. 
But if it hadn't been our town, it would have been some other person's town. The only regret I've ever had about uh, the real regret was the fact that we weren't paid enough money for it or that they didn't relocate us like the government has done in other cases, in some cases, I should say, where they've relocated the people and they've had a chance to stay together, but we were dispersed. We lost all track of one another for so many years. But in, in looking back, it had to be at the time. The Wanapam Indians, who had been fishing near White Bluffs before the time of the acquisition, were also affected by the creation of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Frank Buck, a Wanapam Indian, now lives on a 50-acre plot with a few families at Priest Rapids. This land was granted to the Wanapam when the Priest Rapids Dam was built. The Wanapam had been overlooked when Governor Isaac Stevens made treaties with the Columbia tribes in 1855. As a result, the Wanapam people did not receive any reservation land or rights to fish for the salmon they needed for survival. Legislation was finally enacted in 1939 that returned fishing rights to the Wanapam. Signers of the petition that helped push through the law included many residents of White Bluffs. Frank recalls fishing at White real Bluffs. Good. Yeah, real good. That's where we used to gill net. That's a lot of fish, and we had big shit, and we'd dry them there and smoke them too, you know. Frank's father was a prophet and spiritual leader of the tribe when they lived on the narrow strip of land near Priest Rapids. During construction of the Hanford Project, the Wanapam were allowed to fish for salmon near White Bluffs. Following World War II, the government restricted activity on the stretch of Columbia River bordering the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. Consequently, fishing rights of the Wanapam were suspended indefinitely. On December 2nd, 1941, five days before the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the nuclear age was born at the University of Chicago. This event led to the planning of a facility to produce plutonium. The group of scientists was headed by Enrico Fermi. The prime contractor for the project was the DuPont Company. Major General Leslie R. Groves of the Army Corps of Engineers was responsible for overseeing the job. The man appointed by Groves to find a site for the project and act as project engineer was Colonel Franklin T. Mathias. Searching for the ideal site, Mathias found the area surrounding White Bluffs and Hanford to fit the requirements. On February 28, 1943, Federal Judge Louis Schwellenbach in the U.S. District Court of Spokane issued an order of possession to the people of White Bluffs and Hanford. The people found out through the newspaper before the official notice reached them by mail. Most people were given 30 days to leave their property. Some had as long as 90 days. Others had as little as 24 hours. Government appraisers made offers to the people for their farms, homes, and businesses. Some people took the first offer given them thinking they had no other choice. However, many people disputed the generally low compensation that was offered to them. These people took their cases to court and got substantially larger settlements. Since it was during wartime, gasoline was scarce, and many belongings were left behind. In a short time, the towns were vacated. Nearly all buildings in the two towns were destroyed to make way for the massive project. Recruiters were sent out to 745 cities to find the needed workers. In a short time, 50,000 people were working and living in what used to be the town of Hanford. All workers went through rigorous security checks before they were allowed to work on the project. Construction went on at an incredible pace. Many buildings were laid out before drawings were available. The DuPont Company employed the most advanced techniques of project management, enabling the work to progress at a rapid pace. Late in 1944, uranium was charged into the first reactor. Completion of the plutonium processing plant was achieved by February 1945. Security at the Hanford facility was a major concern due to the secrecy of the project. 
less than 100 people in the country knew what was actually going on. Hanford plutonium fueled the first test nuclear detonation at Alamogordo, New Mexico, on July 16 of that year. The decision was made by President Truman to use the new bomb against Japan. On August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. The second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki three days later. The displaced residents of Hanford and White Bluffs finally knew what role their towns had played in ending World War II. Near the old town site of Hanford, Washington, the ruins of the high school are the only recognizable remains of the town. High school, we came up that way and... Um, you weren't at the banquet last night? No. Oh, we, we didn't come down until today. Three of our teachers here. Who, was it? Who were they? Uh, Helen Graham was. Every was August since 1968, the high school has been an important landmark on the tour of the communities of Hanford and White Bluffs. The old residents make the tour part of their annual reunion. It begins at the old town site of Hanford, where all that is left is a grid of asphalt streets, once lined by the world's largest trailer court. The high school, which sits halfway between Hanford and White Bluffs, was saved from the wrecking ball through the efforts of the Hanford White Bluffs Pioneer Group. During the annual tour of 1985, the old residents had a surprise interruption of their homecoming. did we come over here? I think basically because of people when they, they're coming out here today for Pioneer Day. And I think that uh, Hanford Patrol wants to keep a pretty good rapport with the old pioneers of the area and you know, show them that we, we still care and, and that we're not trying to you know, hide anything, destroy anything out here. And, uh, we just brought the aircraft out to let them look at it and see what kind of security we have in the area. And probably just a little novelty type thing. The tour continues to the old site of White Bluffs, where the only existing building is the bank. Two members of the White Bluffs community, Harry Anderson and Estelle Krug, are a few of the people who continue to walk through the remains of their old town. Edmund Anderson, Harry's father, ran the movie house in White Bluffs. He was also an amateur filmmaker. The movies he took appear earlier in this program. So we're standing here in White Bluffs. Now, what did it used to look like? All we can see is the old bank. Oh. So we know there was a barber shop there. Yeah. What else used to be here? And a drugstore down here, run by the Englishes, Mr. and Mrs. English. And you could buy ice cream there. <laughs> ice cream cones were wonderful. <laughs> it was kind of pleasant, but um, we didn't have much to live on. We just, we had a cow. <laughs> And uh, we had a little two acre, not quite two acres, or about an acre and a half place right down here. And it's gone. You can't even find where it was, except that there were some locust trees. And I think that's the only way you can tell that any um, places here, because there's, the roads are so different. We don't have the same roads that we used to have. <laughs> the tour comes to an end here at White Bluffs where one day every year the town comes to life for a few people who once lived there. The high security area of the Hanford Nuclear Reservation returns to business as usual as the last of the old residents file out the main gate. The reunion of the pioneer group culminates with a picnic at a city park in the nearby town of Richland a town that survived the acquisition of 1943 to become a major center of nuclear energy development. 
For these people who have come from all corners of the country, it is a chance to share last goodbyes and to look forward to the next year when the spirit of their communities will be revived once more. For most of the past residents of Hanford and White Bluffs, the acquisition of their land by the government in 1943 has become an isolated event. For some of those who remained in the area, the Hanford Project meant jobs and a renewed prosperity. Post-war development of atomic energy directed more funding to nuclear power and defense programs. For the government of the United States, the Hanford Reservation has been an ideal location, geographically and politically, for defense programs and development activities in nuclear power. The selection of Hanford as a possible location of a national nuclear waste repository and growing concern over the aging N reactor has focused renewed interest on this southeastern corner of Washington state. The initial acquisition of the Hanford Reservation affected the lives of the Wanapam and residents of a few small communities. Post-war activities at Hanford and its future use is now a national issue.